Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen. A uh, lot of great pleasure to introduce Stan Clayman, who whose book Kill or Capture is spectacularly good. And uh, Dan is a special correspondent for Newsweek and the Daily Beast. He was Newsweek's managing editor from 2006 to 2011. He was the magazine's Washington bureau chief between 2001 and 2006. And um, he was also a Ferris prof professor at Princeton University in 2010. So Dan is going to speak for 10, 20, 30 minutes about the big themes of his book. I'll engage him in some Q&A and then op open it up to you. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> Hi. Thank you. You, you all hear me well? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me here. Uh, uh, this is a, a terrific institution. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, uh, I have to say, um, I, for all of you baseball fans out there, uh, Miguel Cabrera uh, just won the Triple Crown. Uh, but in my world, um, uh, Peter is the winner of the Triple Crown for what we do. Um, uh, he is uh, a brilliant analyst. Uh, he's a great reporter. What I love is that he's still a reporter, um, and uh, and he's a marvelous uh, storyteller. And uh, Manhunt uh, was just a terrific book, um, and so um, I'm especially honored to be here and to be questioned by you. So thank you. Um, I thought that since we're uh, a month out from the election and uh, national security has made a kind of dramatic late entry uh, into this race. Uh, I would talk um, about uh, Obama. Um, he's the central character of my book. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about what I learned about him in the course of reporting the book. Um, at, at the very least, I think he serves as a, as a good uh, kind of organizing principle to lay out the themes of killer, killer capture and to illuminate the administration's um, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, in prosecuting the war on terror. And the first thing I would say uh, for anybody who uh, sets out to write a book about uh, this president, it's enormously challenging. Um, he is a, uh, uh, such an elusive and complicated uh, figure. Um, it's not that he's opaque. Um, he's, he's sort of an open book in a lot of ways. Uh, but he is, um, you know, he, he's, he, he lives in a world full of contradictions and he embraces those uh, contradictions. And uh, he tends to, nuance, uh, to, to gravitate toward uh, nuance and, and complexity. Um, and, um, and I think that was particularly true uh, in his first year uh, when he was um, trying to sort of searching to figure out his, his, his MO um, in his approach uh, to the fight against Al Qaeda, uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, and, and to answer a set of, of questions that are really, uh, you know, really vexing. And so, what I tried to do with this book uh, is, to the extent that I I, I could, sort of uh, lift lift the curtain back and and uh, and get a sense of that personal struggle, is to sort of reveal that um, and and how he sort of wrestled with, uh, and in some ways, in very anguished ways. Uh, you know, sort of pitting uh, uh, morality and law against security, uh, uh, politics uh, against uh, principle, uh, and that's really sort of the story of my book writ large. Um, as I thought about Obama and as I reported on him, uh, I, I sort of started thinking of, of there being more than one Obama, about, for the purposes of my story, sort of three Obamas. Um, and. Uh, and so I thought I would go through those facets of his, of his uh, persona. Um, and they are, just quickly, Obama, the law professor, uh, you know, who promised to, to, uh, to, to develop a new legal uh, uh, framework for fighting the war on terrorism, um, but who also, as a law professor, has a kind of a cerebral and, at times, uh, uh, detached uh, side to him, which is relevant. Uh, Obama, the the uh, the Paul, um, and in in some ways um, that might be his weakest link. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, you know, not temperamentally suited to the kind of jawboning and 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 arm twisting uh, that 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 is sometimes necessary, uh, particularly uh, in dealing with Congress, and that's part of my story as well. Um, but also, um, uh, and this is on the positive side, 
someone who could be um, uh, pretty ruthlessly pragmatic um, when he was balancing uh, many, many priorities and difficult choices. Um, and he got criticism for some of that, uh, but I see that as uh, actually a, a, a good thing. And then there's Obama the warfighter. Um, and um, and that's, uh, that was naturally the least developed aspect of his, of his personality. Uh, because he didn't have any experience um, in that realm. Um, and, um, but he did come in with certain instincts uh, that I think uh, uh, that, that I think many of us didn't appreciate uh, when he was running. Um, we, we couldn't have because we couldn't see it. Um, and um, I would say you can't disentangle any of these aspects of his sort of presidential uh, profile. Um, they are, um, you know, sometimes he, he drew, drew on all of them. Sometimes uh, uh, they were more harmoniously in balance uh, with each other, and other times uh, he sort of doubled down on one aspect of his personality uh, for good or for ill um, and less on the others. Uh, but they are all there um, and, and all part of uh, who he was as president, uh, who he is as president, and, and as uh, the commander in chief in the war on, on terrorism. Um, so let me take them in order. Just talk very briefly about Obama, the law professor. Uh, in his uh, first year of his presidency in particular, he really struggled uh, with, with these issues, um, uh, particularly the issues of you know, balancing security and, and, and liberty and, and uh, some of the complicated legal questions surrounding the kind of reform uh, that he wanted to, to make. Um, uh, sometimes to the point of, of anguish, um, which really surprised me in, in my reporting. Um, he was extraordinarily and deeply involved um, in, in kind of um, creating this, uh, this, trying to create this new sort of legal architecture. Um, I was amazed at the number of meetings he attended, at the kind of legal seminars that he put on with his advisors, hours and hours. Uh, you know, Justice Department lawyers would come over uh, because there was an important uh, a legal brief uh, that they had to file. We're talking about in maybe March uh, of uh, 2009. And in some of these early briefs, they were essentially laying out uh, their positions on, on, on the war on terror, what they could do, what they couldn't do, who they could kill, who they couldn't kill, detention. And he was, you know, really involved in, in, these, in, these, uh, in these questions. And, you know, about what the what authorities he had, fretting over the precedents uh, that he might leave behind, um, and you know, there are a lot of people out there who would criticize him uh, for this. You know, pedophaging, uh, uh, you know, risk-averse lawyer. That's not what we need when we're fighting against a brutal nihilistic enemy. Um, I disagree with that. Um, I think it was enormously impressive um, in, in a lot of ways and reassuring. Um, after eight years uh, when lawyers uh, you know, didn't get the memos, uh, were left out of meetings, and were effectively uh, marginalized. I wouldn't say eight years. I should revise that. Certainly the first few years uh, of the Bush uh, administration in this area, uh, l lawyers were, were somewhat pushed aside. I think it was important for the president to set this tone to restore um, lawyers to, uh, to, this, uh, to this process. Uh, you can debate about whether they got the equilibrium right, but it was an important thing to do. Um, just one quick example um, uh, from the book. Um, you know, uh, fairly early on, uh, Obama's advisors realized uh, that closing Guantanamo was going to be a lot, uh, much more of a challenge than they had anticipated. They should have realized that before they came in. They probably should have realized that before Obama made the promise. But then again, John McCain was making the same promise, and everybody else pretty much was. Uh, they they, they um, were confronted with one insoluble problem uh, from the outset at, in Guantanamo, which was there was about 50 detainees, I think it was 48, uh, who could not be um, released or transferred because either because they were simply too dangerous. Um, uh, there, was, uh, there wasn't a, a, a case that you could make against them. You couldn't prosecute them uh, because uh, either they had been you know, subject to uh, 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 brutal interrogation techniques um, or uh, because uh, there simply wasn't uh, strong enough evidence evidence against them. The intelligence was strong that they were, were, were uh, dangerous, but you couldn't make a case in court. So what are you going to do uh, with these uh, uh, 50 or so 
uh, detainees. Well, after a lot of debate within the administration, the, the uh, determination among uh, Obama's advisors, and they believed that Obama uh, uh, was behind them on this, was that they would simply have to be held indefinitely without trial. Well, that uh, you know, was going to be controversial. The base of, of the Democratic Party was not going to be happy about that. But there was really no choice as Obama's uh, uh, advisors saw it. So in a meeting in July of 2009, uh, Greg Craig, who's the White House counsel at the time, Jim Jones, the national security advisor, they bring Obama essentially a, uh, an executive order. Um, it's a detailed memo uh, that lays out indefinite detention without trial for this set of uh, legacy detainees, as they call them. Not for anybody that they captured in the future, but for the new detainees. And they expected Obama to sign it. They give it to him. He reads it over, leans back in his chair. He says, you know, guys, you've done excellent work. You've clearly thought this through. Uh, it's very impressive. But I'm not sure I can go there. I'm just not sure I'm prepared to do this. Um, and here was the president as constitutional lawyer talking to them about uh, what he thought um, you know, was a policy that, that, uh, you know, that really violated you know, basic um, principles of, of American jurisprudence, justice. Um, but he said a, a, an interesting thing. Um, he said, um, I'm not sure I want to leave a loaded weapon. I, I'm not sure I want to le leave a loaded weapon lying around. Um, and for the lawyers in the room, they were mostly lawyers, um, they realized that Obama was quoting, and not, not to get too, too uh, academic here, but Obama was quoting uh, uh, Justice uh, Robert Jackson's famous dissent uh, in the Korematsu, uh, the notorious Korematsu Supreme Court case, uh, which was uh, when the uh, Supreme Court upheld uh, the uh, Japanese internment program during uh, World War II. And what the president was saying, I think the quote is, uh, precedent lies around like a loaded weapon. What the president was saying was, I don't want, I, I don't want to leave those kinds of powers uh, uh, behind. If I sign this order, it'll mean that every president who comes after me will feel that they can do it. And I'm not sure I want to leave future presidents with that kind of power. Now, mind you, he was supremely confident in his own uh, ability to, to, uh, to have that power. But he was worried about his successors. Then he said a particularly prescient thing politically. He said, I'm not sure. He said, what, you know, Mitt Romney may be the next president, that president. And I'm not sure I want to leave uh, that kind of power uh, with uh, Mitt Romney. Um, I, I think that is all uh, impressive. Uh, ultimately, uh, uh, he, uh, he did sign off on a limited uh, indefinite detention policy. Uh, it took another year, at least, uh, before he signed off on it, but he did. Um, he has not uh, enshrined indefinite detention in law. He's not gone, he never went to the Congress. Uh, uh, he has not held anyone indefinitely other than those who remain at, at, at Guantanamo. Um, the downside of Obama's, um, uh, you know, the sort of law, profession, law professor side of Obama is that in this you know, balancing of all of these difficult issues, whether it was detention policy or uh, you know, where to try the 9-11 the uh, defendants, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, um, he, he tended to, to vacillate and temporize. And he bobbed and weaved between his advisors and played for time in the sort of ever diminishing hope that uh, the politics would turn his way. He, he was indecisive. He could not make these decisions. He had uh, you know, uh, certain people the, po the political types uh, whispering in his ear that he had to do these things. He had, uh, uh, you know, er Eric Holder, the Attorney General, or Valerie Jarrett, or frankly, I, I suspect uh, 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 Michelle, uh, 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 the First Lady, telling him that he needed to stay true to his uh, first principles. And he had an extremely hard time uh, making uh, uh, decisions. And he was elusive to his own advisors, and that created confusion uh, about, uh, about, about who was in control of policy, about what the president really believed. Um, and and, and in, that, in that vacuum, uh, the, his advisors uh, fought brutally over these issues, um, and each side invoked the president's support in his cause because they all believed that Obama was on 
you know, on, on their side. Um, and that led to more delay. And, and I was uh, really amazed at the, the amount of kind of dysfunction and animosity uh, over these issues uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the halls of the White House. In fact, it, one of the stories I tell uh, is a sort of extraordinary confrontation between uh, Eric Holder uh, and David Axelrod, where they nearly came to blows, I mean, literally. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Valerie Jarrett, who's, uh, who was nearby, kind of materialized her sense of decorum uh, uh, disturbed. And she got in literally got in between them and said, you guys have to take this out of the hallway. Um, so there was an enormous amount of tension over these issues. Uh, not surprisingly, in some ways, because they're very, very difficult. And, uh, um, um, you know, and, and, but partly because people didn't know where the president stood on some of these uh, issues. Um, the other problem with that law professor side of his personality is he could, at times, uh, it, it was sort of temperamental. He could seem uh, detached um, and uh, uh, in, in, in response to the threat um, to, to terrorism. He was, you know, sort of not enough, too, too much the law professor, not enough the warrior. And I think everyone remembers uh, the, uh, the underwear bombing um, uh, incident, uh, uh, Christmas Day 2009, when it took Obama three days uh, before he, uh, he came out to address the American people. Um, and David, Ax when I interviewed David Axelrod, um, he sort of fell on his sword. He said, you know, I apologized to the president afterwards. That was my fault. I told him not to come out. You know, he needed to decompress after a very difficult year. Well, you know, that may be, but I think it was also uh, Obama's instincts. I think it was his intellectualized approach to these issues. I believe uh, that he sincerely believed, and, and, uh, and, and I commend him for this in some ways, that uh, uh, we had to sort of, uh, as he would put it, break the fever uh, that, uh, that, that, that moved beyond the politics of fear. And what kind of a message would it send if the president, you know, every time there's a uh, uh, unsuccessful uh, terrorist attack, the president comes rushing out to the microphones. Uh, that's what happened during the Bush years. He wasn't going wasn't to do that. What he didn't fundamentally understand uh, at that point in his presidency was the, the symbolic powers uh, uh, of the commander in chief to calm a fearful uh, public. Um, and uh, that was a real turning point moment uh, for, uh, for this uh, White House. I think. Uh, it took a real psychic toll uh, on, on Obama's advisors. And I think they sort of saw Obama's presidency flash before their eyes. Because if that had been successful and 300 some odd civilians had died, uh, they saw that as being you know, presidency uh, ending. And so that had a tremendous impact going forward. Um, and, uh, and I think had something to do with, with the administration's, uh, the White House's being less forceful uh, in, in trying to deal with uh, some of these complicated uh, rule of law issues, having nothing to do with how aggressive they were in fighting the war, uh, the, the, the kinetic war, um, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, then there's related Obama, the, uh, the, the politician. Um, and you always have, I always had to remember when I was writing about this, because I am critical of him, uh, that he did inherit um, a, uh, you know, a, uh, a historic uh, financial crisis. Um, the economy was still in free fall. His advisors were telling him that, you know, in, in, in early 2009, that we really could uh, fall into a depression if we didn't find a way to break the trend. Um, and uh, that kind of atmosphere that they were working in inside the White House, um, uh, you, you just can't discount that. Uh, and you can't think about some of the other things he did in, in a vacuum. That context is uh, important. Um, uh, and, and it is also uh, pretty clear uh, that uh, the politics of fear um, uh, still had a pretty strong grip uh, on, on, on the American people and on Congress. Um, and so uh, uh, they, the, the, the president, his, his political advisors, s saw the, uh, I mean, uh, you know, hysterical reaction. I mean, I can't think of a, of a better word. Uh, the hysterical reaction to some of the proposals uh, that they were talking about um, in those first few months um, and uh, on, on these rule of law issues. Um, and, and this is critical. We're not just talking about the Republicans. We're talking about Democrats and not just Democrats, liberal Democrats. 
what you would hear, wh what I heard and, and w uh, learned about about some of the behind the scenes meetings um, where, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Barbara Boxer and, and, and Mikulski and, and, you know, they were ru you know, running for re-election um, and really worried about, um, uh, about what, um, uh, you know, h how terrorism and, and, and the sort of fear and around it could affect their, their campaigns. That was real. All you have to do is look at one of the very early Guantanamo votes uh, having to do with restrictions on bringing detainees uh, to the United States, 90 to 6. You know, Obama could muster uh, only six Democrats uh, in that vote. Could he have gotten more if he had been more LBJ-like? You know, maybe. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that was uh, heavy, heavy lifting. Um, let me talk very, how am I doing on time, by the way? Okay, okay. Let me talk very briefly about one episode that, um, uh, that uh, I think was a, uh, a key turning point in terms of the politics. Um, uh, and, and, and that is um, the story of the Uyghurs, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll tell very uh, briefly. Um, uh, this is um, the Obama administration realized uh, pretty quickly uh, that to close Guantanamo, um, uh, the only way to do it was to convince our allies around the world to take some of these, a lot of these detainees. And they understood. Uh, that if they were going to persuade the Germans and the French and, you know, whoever else to take detainees, we were going to have to do our part. Uh, and so there was a plan hatched um, early on uh, to take a small number of, of Uyghurs. These were uh, Chinese dissidents, Muslims, um, who uh, had uh, been fighting against uh, their oppressors in China, but there wasn't a lot of evidence, really very little at all, that they were uh, they were, um, uh, you know, wanted to attack America. And in fact, the courts had cleared them. They were all cleared for, for release. Um, and so there was a plan to bring a small number of them into the United States. There's a Uyghur community uh, in Northern Virginia, and, um, uh, and that plan fell apart. And, you know, I always thought you know, it was amazing in some ways that Barack, and I don't think I'm exaggerating here, in some ways, Barack Obama's uh, 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 efforts to reform the war on terror foundered uh, on, you know, uh, uh, an obscure Turkic-speaking people, you know, from the uh, northwest reaches of, of Central Asia. Uh, but, but what happened was um, uh, it leaked um, to, to a newspaper. Frank Wolf, a backbench uh, member of Congress from Northern Virginia, uh, went to the House floor uh, and started giving speeches about, you know, terrorists are coming to your neighborhood, he told his, his colleagues uh, in, in the House. Uh, this was literally a, a this was, a, you know, a nim this was the NIMBY explosion. This was, this was the moment uh, when um, Congress, uh, you know, it was, it was like a wildfire, it just spread through Congress, and terrorists were coming to your backyards, and uh, this is a terrible thing, and Obama just caved. Uh, he saw the reaction um, in Congress, and he said, we're not doing this. I'm not sure he'd been sufficiently briefed about it, although all of his advisors had signed on to it, Rahm Emanuel included. He said, no way, we're not doing this. It's not, it's not worth the political capital. By this time, they decided they were going to do health care reform. They weren't going to do it. Well, for... Uh, Chinese dissidents who pose zero threat to the United States, um, and uh, we didn't have the resilience, to use a word that Peter and I uh, sometimes use in this context, the political resilience uh, to bring them to the, United, to the United States. You could argue it the other way, which is what Rahm Emanuel was doing. We're going to let four Uyghurs, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep us from, uh, from, from getting our domestic agenda through. Now, there's no way we could know that. My guess is they could have walked and chewed gum at the same time, resettled the Uyghurs, uh, showed resilience uh, toward Congress, um, but they didn't. And it was, a, it was a subtle, maybe not so subtle, sign uh, to the Congress, to Republicans uh, in Congress, that this administration was not going to really aggressively engage uh, engage them on, on, on these issues. And, and um, you know, it's hard to know what would have happened um, if, they had, if they had at that moment decided, no, you know, we're going to take on this fight. Uh, but they didn't. Um, and I think that had some impact. Um, 
All right, I will start to, to wind down. I just want to say um, uh, Obama, um, he, he didn't give up, uh, uh, but he, on, on these issues, I think he still believed that he could uh, uh, bring the country along. And he did it, tried to do it in classic Obama fashion, which was to, to give a, uh, a speech. And he gave a wonderful speech uh, at the archives um, in, in, uh, in, early, in the spring of 2009. It's really gorgeous. Uh, and I talked to Ben Rhodes, who described how uh, Obama called him up to his office, to the Oval Office, and you know, spent an hour literally dictating it, dictating it to him, just unfurling it, you paragraph after paragraph, because these issues were, issues were churning in his head, and he was thinking about them you know, very deeply. Um, and uh, he said all the right things, uh, but, uh, but they didn't have the p politi political muscle <coughs> behind it, um, and, and ultimately, uh, it, it didn't really go anywhere. Ultimately, the, you know, the power of the president is the power to persuade, um, and um, uh, he did it uh, in, in his way, give a speech, change the political culture, um, but it, it fell short, <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and he was not able to do it. And here we are, uh, uh, four years later, o Obama, uh, Guantanamo, not, not closed, no, no real chance that it will close anytime soon, I don't think. Um, let me talk just briefly, and then I'll end, um, about Obama, the warfighter. Obviously, he had no experience. He had very little national security, very little foreign policy experience, really no national security experience. Um, the, uh, w one quick story, uh, in, in the spring of 2007, when he was just getting his campaign going, um, he, uh, invited, uh, Richard Clark over, uh, to talk to him about some of these issues, basically interviewing him. See, he was looking for a uh, counterterrorism advisor. And um, Clark tells this story about, uh, uh, you know, Clark was, was very impressed with Obama, uh, very much uh, uh, thinking along the same lines about how they had to uh, fight a different kind of war, uh, you know, we'd compromised our values, you know, in the, at Guantanamo and in the prison cells of Abu Ghraib, we had to change the message to the Muslim world, um, we had to fight a much more sophisticated, uh, uh, nuanced war against, against terrorism. What he didn't know about Obama was whether he was too much the kind of effete intellectual and not enough the warrior. He did, that whether he, whether he uh, didn't ha have this kind of in his gut uh, the, 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 the sort of strength that you needed to have to fight this kind of uh, to war, the, the kind of, you know, the sort of, um, you have to almost have a kind of a, 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 an atavistic warrior-like uh, kind of thing, and, and, he, and, he, and he didn't know about that. So he said to Obama in this meeting, he said, you know, um, Senator, as president, um, you have to kill people. And uh, he said, I'm not talking about just sending troops, you know, conventional armies into wars. You know the names and addresses of the people you have killed. Wow. Well, Obama um, didn't say anything. He looked him in the eye, and very quietly, but very firmly, he just said, I know that. And to Clark, that was a moment where, where he sort of saw something, saw a kind of a steeliness uh, that he had not perceived uh, before. Um, a few months later, Clark helped him write the one counterterrorism speech uh, that uh, he gave during the uh, 2008 campaign, which Peter knows about and has talked about, uh, this was at the Wilson Center, August 1st, um, and uh, there's a the famous line from that speech um, is he said, "If there's actionable intelligence, um, and um, uh, Musharraf in, in Pakistan, actionable intelligence to go after a high-value target, and Musharraf won't do it, I will." And that was an important moment. It showed you know, that as a Democrat who'd been a community, uh, you know, organizer and, and people had doubts about, about uh, whether he was, a, you know, too squishy on these issues, that he was tough, he was going to do it. But there was another line in that speech that I hadn't noticed until I started researching my book uh, that's as important and, and but less noticed. Um, he said, um, I, will ensure that the I will ensure that the military becomes more stealthy agile and lethal in its ability to capture or kill terrorists. And I, we should have paid close attention to that line. Um, I think people didn't realize how quickly, once he became president, how quickly and intuitively uh, 
uh, Obama, you know, took to the sort of the world of intelligence and, uh, uh, and, 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 and special operations. And what I think Obama perceived early on um, was that these capabilities um, were very much in line with his, his basic approach to fighting the war on, on terrorism. You have to remember he was elected in part to, uh, uh, to, uh, to end the wars of 9-11. He was going to end the war in Iraq, uh, win decisively um, in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, and then bring the troops home as quickly as, as, uh, as possible. Um, he, uh, yeah, I think he, he realized already uh, whether he was talking about drones or not. One of his advisors said he was already talking about drones. But the drones and SEALs and special operations al would allow him to be more surgical, uh, uh, precise, uh, and deadly uh, in, the, in the face of these persistent and morphing threats uh, while allowing the United States to lighten its footprint uh, in, in, in this part of the world. That became essentially the Obama doctrine, uh, as, as people uh, now talk about it. What he didn't want to do and uh, what he's resisted, although not always successfully, and we can talk about you know, Yemen and Mali and things that are happening now, is to get sucked into local insurgencies, civil wars. Um, he wanted to remain, as he would later call it, you know, AQ focused. Uh, uh, he, was a, he was a realist when it comes to foreign policy and national security. Uh, he wanted to uh, be careful about identifying those interests and, and act accordingly. Um, and I think that is, has a lot to do why he made the decision that he would personally sign off on, uh, on, on, on the, uh, many of the targeted killings, which is something that got a lot of attention that I write about in the book and that we can talk about. Um, so I have one last point. Do I have time for one last point? Of okay. There's one last point, which is quick, um, but it, it, it does go to the sort of larger theme about these different Obamas. This is one example where you might think that the law professor would overwhelm uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the war fighter, and it didn't. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Republicans early on, um, the first year, Dick Cheney in particular, um, attacked President Obama for having a pre-9-11 uh, mentality, that he didn't fundamentally get that we were at war, that it, that it was a criminal justice approach uh, to uh, fighting uh, terrorism. Um, by this time, we didn't know that, you know, he'd ordered whatever it was. You, ha you have the figures, twice as many drone strikes as, as, as President Bush had during the entire eight years of his presidency. Um, uh, and that he was well on the way uh, to decimating the leadership of, of al-Qaeda. Uh, but this was the line from, from Cheney and the Republicans at the time. Um, the best example of Obama embracing the war paradigm over a criminal justice approach was the decision to kill Anwar al-Awlaki, uh, to put him on the kill list and, and then to, to have him killed. I mean, this was a fateful step for an American president. Uh, the premeditated killing of a United States citizen without trial or any judicial process. Um, and um, you might think that Obama, the law professor, would have been wringing his hands over this decision. Um, to the contrary, uh, this really surprised me in my reporting. I spoke to about a half a dozen people uh, who advised Obama on this particular uh, episode. Um, and uh, very deeply involved in, 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 in the decision. And they all said essentially the same thing. Um, Obama had no qualms um, about this. And now, th this is something that will be debated for a long time. I'm not right now making a judgment as to whether that was good or bad. I'm just stating it as a fact based on my reporting that this is the way he approached this particular um, episode. He saw it, uh, he saw it as a, a necessary uh, and lawful act uh, uh, of uh, lawful act of war uh, to uh, protect uh, the lives of Americans. Um, and, um, you know, his lawyers at the Justice Department spent a lot of time studying these questions, whether you could do it, you know, wh under what circumstances, whether it was legal or not, constitutional, uh, violated the Fifth Amendment, you know, whatever. Uh, all of that work was kind of post hoc justification. He'd already made the decision by the time he got uh, the legal opinion. Um, he didn't lose any sleep over it, so. Thank you, Dan. Um, 
You know, uh, one of the uh, criticisms of the Obama administration has been that um, there were sort of selective leaks to journalists in order to paint the president as uh, sort of either tough on Iran or tough, tough on terrorists. Did you feel like you were sort of, you know, part of a, you know, did, did you feel like there was an orchestrated campaign to inform you of these things, or is it, is that a fair criticism? No, I, I you know, you know, some, there were there were times <laughs> when I was reporting this book and wondering how the hell am I going to, you know, learn about how they make decisions about drones, where I was hoping, <laughs> you know, maybe I would be, uh, you know, uh, selected to be part of a White House campaign. Um, but no, it didn't happen. Um, I did it the old-fashioned way. Um, and, you know, I think people who make these charges, I think John McCain made these charges, a lot of politicians on the Hill um, either don't know a whole lot about how um, national security reporting works or don't care um, and, wanted mm -hmm. to make a and wanted to make a political uh, uh, point. Um, uh, the reality is uh, that it's from the ground up. I spent, you know, I've been reporting in this area for uh, quite a long time, but um, I uh, had to really work the, the, the national security bureaucracy, uh, the intelligence um, agencies, law enforcement agencies, and, um, you know, you work, um, you know, around the perimeter and you work your way in. And if you're lucky and you get um, good material, um, you know, eventually uh, you can go, uh, uh, you know, to the White House and say, you know, I've got this stuff um, and I'm, I'm going to tell this story and I'd like to get your perspective on it. Um, and in that situation, you know, um, you know for the most part, um, the, the White House uh, would not confirm uh, things that were, you know, highly classified. I, I did not get that kind of help from, from the White House. So uh, there was, there was, the idea that there was a, this was an orchestrated campaign, first of all, you know, to bolster the uh, credentials, the national security uh, uh, credential of the president. Well, to some extent, my reaction is, you know, I'm shocked there's gambling in the casinos. The White House actually wants to make the president look good. <laughs> of course they do, um, but, um, but, but in my case anyway, they didn't do it by, by leaking classified information to me. Right. Um, the genesis of the book, I mean, you know, David Sanger obviously he wrote a book which covers some of the issues. He, he covers sort of more of a, the whole waterfront of national security issues. When you started thinking about the book, was it always your intention to focus on these kind of kill or capture issues or? Yeah, that's a great, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, you sort of, uh, this actually grew out of, and my agent Gail Ross is here, uh, so uh, she uh, was very persistent. <laughs> And it wouldn't have happened without Gail. But it grew out of actually a profile I did uh, back in um, early 2009, the sp spring of 2009, summer of 2009, uh, of Eric Holder, um, who uh, I covered for a long time. I came up in journalism covering uh, uh, legal issues. And I covered the, the FBI and the Justice Department. And then over time, started doing more national security. But I did a profile of, uh, of Holder uh, that was uh, really built around um, his own uh, involvement in making some of these national security uh, and legal decisions. And the real tension and drama in that story was whether he was going to uh, launch an investigation into uh, the Bush era uh, torture uh, program. And uh, it, it was my. So, so it was a, it was a kind of a window into those early tensions in the administration uh, between the you know the lawyers and the polit and the and the political people in the White House. Obama, as you may recall, didn't really want an investigation. He talked about wanting to look forward, not backward. Um, and Holder, you know, who's independent as an attorney general, felt strongly about, ultimately felt strongly about doing this. And so I wanted to sort of get at that tension. I realized that there was great drama uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the conflicts uh, uh, within the administration over these national security decisions. So the book really began as sort of telling that story, but you know, um, it evolved as the story, as what was happening out there evolved. And it became, I remember, six months into it when I realized, oh my God, I'm going to have to tell the drone, the drone story. <laughs> and frankly, I didn't have 
you know, a lot of great sources in that area. Um, so um, that was terrifying, um, but, uh, I'm, but obviously it was a really important part of the story. So it, it, it then uh, evolved in that direction, um, and it also became much more of an Obama story uh, as, as time went on. Holder comes out of the book almost as sort of a tragic figure when I, as I read it. I mean, basically he lost every fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in some ways, uh, uh, definitely. Um, he, um, uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, he, he survived. Um, but I guess the question is, um, you know, is it the kind of survival that you necessarily want? Because hmm. ultimately, um, you know, he was in, in this area, in, in, in the national security sphere, a lot of the things that where he put his money down, he wasn't able to achieve. Uh, the, uh, the, the big fight for him was the decision to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in Manhattan. Um, and uh, that, that's an extraordinary story because he really had uh, the uh, Rahm Emanuel, very powerful chief of staff, um, trying to undermine him at, at every turn. Um, and so much that, he, that Rahm Emanuel was working with uh, uh, Lindsey Graham, a senator from the opposition party, uh, to try to keep this from happening. And this is a classic example of the president sort of uh, vacillating and floating above the fray and telling Holder one thing and telling others another. And, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, it, it, it did not obviously succeed for Holder. I think he feels like he was able to keep um, his, uh, uh, his, you know, hold on to his dignity because he, he did what he believed was right. He lost, but he fought the good fight. Um, he had an interesting kind of personal struggle going on in some ways, which is that some of you remember that he was Deputy Attorney General under Bill Clinton. And at the tail end of the Clinton administration, it was, it was Holder who had uh, uh, kind of green-lighted the, the Mark Rich pardon, that very controversial pardon of the uh, uh, financial uh, fugitive, um, got extremely just very, you know, criticized for that. Um, his integrity was questioned. People said it was essentially a corrupt act uh, and that he had sold his independence, you know, for political purposes. Um, and I think he felt that he needed uh, redemption. And I think part of what he did in the second, in, in the Obama administration was try to win back that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, redemption. This drove the White House uh, mad because they thought he was on a kind of, kind of a personal, Jihad. Jihad, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brennan, obviously, you know, it, it's, how would you score him in terms of his importance in this administration and maybe also kind of zoom out a bit further and think about how important he might be compared to other uh, people in the National Security Council staff? He seems to have almost a complete lock on many of these decisions, right? Yeah, you know, I don't think uh, Brennan... Uh, veers out of his lane a whole lot, but if it is in any way related to uh, uh, counterterrorism or, uh, uh, so he was involved also in, in many of the discussions about you know, the troop surge and what was going on in Afghanistan, anything that's related uh, to that larger uh, uh, war, um, he is uh, absolutely critical uh, player in this administration and that's uh, uh, partly because of his experience, because of his uh, you know, you know, 25, 30 years in the intelligence community, but also because he and Obama uh, just had a real uh, connection. I mean, they uh, didn't know each other. Uh, they didn't even know each other uh, during the campaign. Um, it wasn't until the transition when people were talking about Bren uh, Brennan as a possible CIA director uh, that they met. Um, that ended up uh, not happening because uh, of the allegations that he had uh, somehow been involved in some of the controversial Bush programs. But at, uh, during the transition, um, Brennan flew out to uh, Chicago and met at the uh, transition, Obama's transition office in Chicago. And they met really for the first time and they spoke for an hour, an hour and a half. Um, uh, they had some similar experiences in their background. Uh, they'd both traveled uh, to Muslim countries when they were young. Um, but the main thing was um, they uh, were very, in, very much in sync on uh, the sort of basic approach uh, to the war on terror. This whole idea of being 
uh, surgical and precise. Um, and there was a phrase, I can't remember it right now, but a phrase um, that, uh, that Brennan and, and, and uh, Obama would use uh, about not having a kind of a sweeping approach, uh, but to be as surgical and precise as possible. And in that first conversation, um, Brennan talked to the president about uh, the intelligence community's capabilities, and they talked about drones. This was in the transition. Um, and that um, relationship um, uh, just continued. I mean, it was, uh, they were finishing e each other's sentences. So Brennan um, and Haas Cartwright, the vice uh, chair uh, of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, who also had a kind of a similar uh, relationship with Obama. They really, had, there was a real kind of trust there. It was the two of them who would go, um, uh, you know, after the National Security Council, after they had these, these uh, civets meetings, these secure teleconference, teleconferences to decide whether someone should be killed or not in a, in a, you know, a drone strike or a targeted killing. It was Brennan and Haas Cartwright who would, uh, who would go and have quiet conversations with the president about whether to do the strike or not. Um, and it was this kind of, uh, um, kind of troika of targeted killings, the three of them. Sometimes they would pull Obama out of a black tie dinner or uh, Brennan, um, uh, what he least his least favorite thing to do was uh, there were times when there was a very narrow window of opportunity. There was an opportunity to strike at someone in Yemen, let's say, and, and uh, Obama would be, you know, having, uh, having dinner or, or uh, doing something with, uh, with, the, with his girls, and, uh, and Brennan would have to uh, <coughs> pull him out of, of those, uh, uh, the, you know, that time with his family to make these, you know, very grim uh, decisions. As you point out in the book, um probably about three years into Obama's uh, uh, term, he had authorized the killing of twice, as, twice the number of people who actually had, been, had gone through Guantanamo. So yeah, sort of yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing uh, statistic if you, if you think about it. Um, um, you know, uh, w one thing that, that you know as well as anybody about when you look at the pure numbers, um, uh, yes, it is true that he authorized many more targeted killings than, than George W. Bush did. Um, but uh, Bush started to ramp up his uh, uh, targeted killing program uh, pretty late in his uh, presidency, what, 2007 uh, or so. <clears throat> and, and that's partly, uh, I think it's, the, the technology had gotten a little better, but I think it was largely because uh, it, it took that long before we had uh, really good human intelligence on the ground um, in, in, in Pakistan, in the tribal areas. And as great as these drones are, and great I mean in terms of uh, te te technically, in terms of precision <coughs> um, and effectiveness, um, they, um, uh, you can't do it without, without um, intelligence uh, on the ground. Um, and um, so, you know, you sort of have to ask yourself, uh, I did when I was thinking about this, um, was this really unique to Obama? Was it something about Obama mm -hmm. personally that, you know, that he decided and only he would have decided to ramp up the drone program? Or would George Bush probably would have as if he had been there longer? McCain, I suspect, would have if he had become president. Hard to know, but that's my, my best guess. You know, and I think Democratic presidents probably would too. Very hard uh, after eight years of war, occupying countries, um, you know, large numbers of casualties, um, uh, you know, for a president, I think, to resist uh, this capability um, where, you know, you don't have to send hundreds of thousands of troops on the ground. Um, and so, um, um, you know, I, I I think it's extraordinary in a lot of ways. It's a very important part of his legacy that he did this. I wonder, I just raised the question how unique, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens if there's uh, a President Romney or, or future presidents. Well, what if, what if there's a second <coughs> Obama term? Would any of the things that, you, that you've been discussing, would there be any substantive changes? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, uh, I would hope, one, one thing I would hope would happen, it already has started, is that there'll be more transparency about the program. Um, the, uh, it started, you know, various people giving speeches, Brennan and the Attorney General and, 
and others have given speeches kind of laying out the, uh, the legal um, framework uh, for the drone program. That's good, but that's just a start. There's a lot more that we ought to know about uh, the vetting process and how they make these, uh, these decisions. Um, I note that um, the, uh, the, the relatively new president of Yemen uh, just said recently, acknowledged publicly that uh, he allows American drone strikes in his country. Um, part of the reason... He also said it was a good thing. And he said it was a good thing. And part of the reason that the CIA has not wanted to talk about this, and the administration has not wanted to talk about it, because they wanted to preserve uh, s some, you know, level of deniability for these countries. They're worried about the political implications. Well, when, when the president of the country says, you know, they're doing it and it's good, it takes that argument away. Um, the other thing that I think we're, we're, you know, we're, we're going to see change and we already have is one thing that Obama tried to do for the first three, three and a half years of his uh, presidency, and I alluded to this before, uh, uh, was to, uh, uh, you know, he, he made a decision, for example, uh, that he wasn't going to authorize uh, these uh, signature strikes in, in Yemen. Uh, and Somalia, and they were, and you all know the, de the distinction between a signature strike and a and a uh, high value or a, a uh, high value uh, a personality strike. Um, in, in a signature signature strike, you don't um, uh, you don't necessarily know the identity of who you're going after. You, there are people who bear certain uh, characteristics associated with terrorism, but you don't necessarily know who they are. And so you're going after, in some cases, a large number of people, and you don't know their identities. Um, and the president was very uncomfortable uh, with that idea. He, there was an early meeting, uh, literally, I think it was three days after he became president, when he was CIA. There was a strike that had gone badly, and I write about it in the in the book. And the CIA came in, and, and, and uh, Steve Kappas, then the CIA director, explained to him what a signature strike was. He couldn't get his mind around this at first. Um, and uh, he ultimately authorized them for Pakistan, but he would not, he held the line, uh, he wouldn't allow them in Yemen or in Somalia. Um, and there were a number of occasions where the military would come to him and he would say, no, we're not doing this. We're staying AQ focused. I only want to go after people who I know to be demonstrable threats against the United States. Um, and he held that position for a long time until uh, you know, uh, the summer of, of uh, uh, I guess it was really uh, quite recently, th th this year, uh, when uh, after the, the, the Arab Spring was, was raging and, and all the turmoil in Yemen and AQAP had uh, taken a lot of land um, in the south um, and, and ultimately he was uh, persuaded that they had to get more aggressive um, and help the Yemeni government uh, seize back that territory. And he authorized uh, signature strikes. They changed the name hmm. um, from signature strikes, which had a bad you know, kind of odor, to something <laughs> called TADS, T-A-D-S, Terrorist Attack Disruption Strikes. Um, so, you know, a little bit Orwellian. I mean, it was a sort of a strange thing. But they're essentially the same thing. And he authorized them. And now the question is going to be, uh, I think it's a fascinating question is with what's been going on in Libya and the Benghazi attack mm. and the, uh, the potential involvement of uh, AQIM. Um, there have been a lot of debates about, about uh, doing strikes in northern Mali where Al-Qaeda has a, a growing foothold and whether Obama will agree to that um, because uh, that means opening up a new front, uh, which is something that he had been... Um, which he had resisted doing and I think really didn't want to do. So that's something to really keep a close eye on. Let's open it up to questions. If you could just uh, identify yourself and wait for the mic. It's a lady in front. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Yava Naturno with the Interactivity Foundation. I have a question uh, in light of um, Obama's policies that, you know, to change a message to the Muslims and to be more surgical and precise on these different levels. Uh, how do you think um, that is working or might change more in light of what's happening, you know, with 
recent killing of ambassador and uh, uprisings in other countries or attacks upon embassies. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's a really good and really important question. Um, and uh, you know, you look at the polling, uh, and it's uh, it's not very encouraging. Um, uh, there, you know, I, I've seen some polls that even suggest that uh, that uh, you know attitudes toward the United States in uh, in the Muslim world are worse now than they were during the Bush administration. I mean, I don't know if I should give that credence, but I've seen those those polls. Um, it's an enormous challenge for um, for for Obama, and I, I am sure that in the National Security Council, when they're debating what to do in Libya right now and whether they should be going after um, the, uh, the perpetrators of, of the Benghazi attack, um, you know, they, are, they are thinking about um, the, the you know, backlash um, in a country that right now um, where the people feel pretty good about America because of our role in, in liberating, um, uh, liberating them. And I, I do think that uh, the President um, is mindful of, of that kind of uh, blowback, um, and he ba has to balance. It's another thing that he has to balance: balance it against um, protecting the you know security of, of 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 American interests, whether it's you know over there or or here. Um, and um, I I don't I, I think if you go back and look at the Cairo speech, you go back and 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 look at a lot of the things that he said during the uh, uh, the um, campaign, he's clearly fallen short. Um, he created, I think, high expectations, and he has not met those expectations. I don't underestimate the challenge of, of, of really, um, you know, uh, uh, fundamentally changing attitudes uh, toward the United States. Um, he could give up the drone program. I don't know if that would make a difference. This gentleman over here. Yeah. Yeah, two-part question. Uh, there's been two studies that have come out over the past two weeks, the Stanford, NYU, and the Columbia Law School on drone strikes, which are pretty hair-raising, both in terms of the lack of surgical precision for all the talk about it yeah. and, and the, the impact on civilians and also the legal implications in terms of violations of the law of armed conflict and, and international humanitarian law. So the question is, have you looked at those and what are your thoughts on that? And secondly, why are you so sure you know what's going on with these drone strikes? I mean, one of the takeaways, especially from the Columbia study and JSOC, is hardly anybody knows except them what they're doing. Yeah. It's done in absolute secrecy, and a lot of people that talk about them don't really know what's going on with these things. It's a really great, really important question. Actually, Peter is a better, is, it's probably uh, uh, a, a, a more qualified in some ways to answer this question than I am because of all the work he's done um, studying uh, uh, dr uh, drones and here. Um, I have not yet because uh, I gave myself a, a break from some of these national security issues and I've been writing about um, politics in the Supreme Court lately. Um, so I have not had, I have the, sti the, the uh, I don't have the Columbia, uh, uh, so I have the other one and I haven't, but I haven't read it yet. I plan to read both of them. Uh, because they looked serious to me, and they looked like they were very worthy um, of serious attention. Um, the the how do I know? Um, uh, you know, you 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 can't know for sure. Um, uh, and I think that when when I think Brennan made a huge mistake, I think when he was announcing the. Uh, counterterrorism strategy a couple of years ago at, at SICE, I think it was, uh, and, he, and he made that statement that uh, in the past year there had been no uh, civilian fatalities. I mean, I think that was not true, and I think it was uh, imprudent for him to, to, to say uh, uh, what, he, what he said. Um, uh, you know, I've seen studies on both sides. Um, you know, I've seen studies that, that uh, uh, n none of the studies I've seen suggest that civilian casualties as, are as low as uh, the administration has, has said. But I've seen a wide range, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of the number of, of, of casualties. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hate to do it, but I sometimes sort of split the difference because I can't know for sure. And I suspect they're not as high as uh, some of the studies have suggested and not as low as many of the others have. 
and it just it remains a really important question and we need to continue trying to figure out uh, what they what what the numbers really are so it's a it's a, not a very satisfactory answer um, but uh, in terms of the precision of the we of the weapons um, uh, I think there's a lot to, of studies that suggest that the, that the weapons are precise the question is um, is the intelligence the, the question is, is the intelligence precise? And that's what's much harder to know. Um, and I think Obama's uh, uh, found this weapon appealing uh, because they're techno technologically precise. I'm sure he's being told that the intelligence is very good. <clears throat> uh, my name is Ralph Krauss, uh, retired. Um, perhaps you wrote, your book uh, gives some historical background on assassinations or targeted killings, and a new new term for the. But I want, but but looking over the index, I I didn't see uh, any reference to uh, Senator Frank Church in the CIA hearings. But perhaps you discussed it, nevertheless, and and it comes to mind. That uh, in the early 30s, uh, Adolf Hitler was applauded for uh, getting rid getting rid of a number of suspected uh, persons. I mean, persons suspected of being uh, treason treasonous. Uh, you you remember that episode? So I, I uh, in regards Osama bin Laden, they they claim that there was he was not to be targeted to be killed. But there are rules of engagement when the soldiers are involved, and you know there's some question there, really. So it's all rather cloudy, it seems to me. And where we're coming from is that a separation of powers. The the, the you know we, we 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 allow the police to arrest somebody that's suspected to have violated the law, but it's up to the court system to uh, administer. Uh, whether he's guilty or not, and are we ignoring these ideas on the international scene? Yeah, well, there's there's a lot in that question. Um, you know, the, the the interesting thing is you mentioned assassinations, Frank Church. Um, uh, I sp spent a lot of time debating whether to use the word assassination um, in my uh, in my in my book uh, interchangeably with uh, targeted killing. Targeted killing does have that feeling of being a a euphemism, um, and uh, I remember when I first heard it was when I was um, a correspondent in in, uh, in in the Mideast in in Jerusalem um, for Newsweek in the in the late uh, 90s, and and um, the Israelis had begun uh, to do these targeted killings, uh, and uh, we, by the way, um, the ambassador at the time was Martin Indyk, uh, and uh, and and he, expressing American policy, was criticizing uh, that. Um, tactic, calling them extra, extrajudicial killings, um, and um, uh, I remember the Israelis at the time saying, well, "Just you wait until you face the same threat," which is what the Israelis will often say. Um, but um, I ended up not using the term assassination um, um, because uh, it has a legal um, connotation um, and. The argument, and you know, you can debate this, uh, but the argument was that that these were lawful acts of war, um, and that they were uh, legal under international law, under a theory of self-defense. Um, they were legal under the authorization for the use of military force. Um, um, that all can be debated, um, and um, uh, I just thought assassination. Uh, I would be making a statement. It would it would be a little too loaded. I'm a reporter. I wasn't making a um, uh, a case against or for. I was trying to tell a story. So I ended up not using uh, the term assassination. But it's a it's a legitimate debate. It's something that um, clearly people care about. We should continue talking about. Um, and uh, I don't I don't remember the rest of your question. Well, but, I, you know, can I follow yeah. up? Because yeah. He, he, the gentleman raises an interesting point. Was the bin Laden operation a kill or capture? You know, there's a, I, I just read a, a, a new book by um, the guy who wrote Black Hawk Down, uh, Bowden. Mark Bowden, yeah. which he had an interview uh, with Obama in which Obama said 
that his preference would have been a capture. I think that's what, I, what yes. the headline said. And Obama was making the case that, you know, if there was any, if there were ever a, uh, an opportunity to make the case that our values are stronger, <laughs> um, are strong, uh, it would be to take Osama bin Laden and put him on trial somewhere. I mean, may, maybe that's what he, he believed. Um, um, I, I imagine that... You have a quote in the book here, yeah. I think, from somebody who addresses this issue head on, right, about, yeah. uh, I think, a lawyer who... Well, I have a, I, I'm have not sure senior, which one you A senior right. defense official, basically, that if bin Laden came out, you know, he was, you know, basically naked and... Yes, right. Well, that's well, well, exactly, well, well, it's interesting. So, so a, a, a very senior official who was involved in the planning said, um, I was asking this precise question, you know, was it a kill, op a kill operation or a capture operation? And, um, and he said, uh, he said if, look, he said if, if, uh, if, if, if bin Laden, if they found bin Laden, he was uh, naked, he was waving a white flag, he was unarmed, and he, and he was unambiguously saying in English, <laughs> I surrender, <laughs> uh, they would have captured him. And uh, the implication of that quote uh, was that it was a kill operation um, mm. in some way. In some some ways, so although he he didn't he didn't say that. Um, I mean, you could also argue that it was a uh, you know that that the and I, th I, th I th by the way uh, the, this the book by um, um, Mark uh, Owen Mark Owen yeah yeah the, the the Navy SEAL who was who pulled the trigger um, or at least did the, took the final shot um, and who wrote this book about the operation um, used very similar language. So I yeah. think that was probably going around um, at, at the time. Um, uh, you know, it is also true uh, that uh, General Cartwright, for example, uh, his job uh, that evening or when that operation was transpiring uh, was to be available, was to deal with all the contingencies if he was captured and not killed. They had a capture plan. They knew that it was a possibility uh, that, you know, that if he did surrender, put his hands up and wasn't armed, there was the, po the possibility that he would be uh, captured because it would be a, you know, a, a, a clear violation of the laws of war if in those circumstances he was killed. Um, and so they had plans to, uh, they, they were, you know, they would try to take him to some third party country possibly. I think they were going to try to possibly take him to Saudi Arabia. They were going to put him on this sh ship for a while. They had contingency plans. I, I don't think that you can, you can say for sure you know, that, uh, that you know, Admiral McRaven and the President and everybody said this is a kill operation. You know, don't capture him under any circumstances. I think it was weighed toward uh, killing over capturing, um, but, uh, but I wouldn't be comfortable saying that it was a kill operation. In the back, Jennifer. Miranda with Hispan TV. At what level these targeted killings or selective assassinations, which is the term they, they use overseas, are designed in order to avoid situations like Guantanamo? Instead of capturing the supposedly alleged um, terrorist being taken as a, um, prisoners to Guantanamo or some other places. And in what level also, there is a pressure of the companies that uh, profit with the war, like those companies that built those drones? That's my question. Well, on the first point, which is a really uh, important question, and people have commented on the title of my book, uh, Killer Capture, that perhaps there really wasn't a choice. It, you know, we weren't capturing anybody, we were killing people, and there were incentives to kill over capturing. The reason being, as you uh, kind of point out, is that um, the legal and the policy and the political uh, uh, issues surrounding capture is just so complicated uh, that it just became easier to, uh, to kill. If you capture them, the policy of, of this administration was not to bring anybody back to Guantanamo, although that was debated, by the way. There were some people who were saying, maybe we should bring, start bringing people to Guantanamo again. The president said, no, absolutely not. Uh, you know, a uh, lot of, obviously, controversy, you know, putting people on trial. Where do you bring them? You know, 
if you capture someone and you can't try them, then are you going to have to sign on to indefinite detention, which the president didn't want to do? So all of those things were extremely complicated, um, and um, uh, which has led a lot of people to believe that, uh, that we were killing instead of capturing beca because of that. Um, I think it's more complicated than that. For one thing, um, the, there were not a lot of opportunities to capture. Um, remember, uh, we were, um, uh, we're not on the ground um, in, in, uh, in Pakistan. We're not really allowed to operate on the ground except for in um, you know, uh, uh, training capacities in, in Yemen. We're not on the ground in Somalia. Now, we've made choices. I mean, uh, conceivably, we could have been more assertive and been on the ground in Yemen and had opportunities to capture people. But for diplomatic reasons and political reasons, we didn't do that. Um, so uh, there weren't a lot of opportunities uh, to capture. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, I talked to a lot of people who, who and one, one person, very senior person, who advised the president on these issues uh, on a regular basis, who said uh, that uh, this was always in the, in the back of our minds, uh, and, and, and we were always thinking about this conundrum, and that the idea that it didn't, in some ways, create incentives for, uh, to kill um, you know, it's just not true. It, it did. Um, maybe more subtle um, and not explicitly talked about in meetings, but it was a factor. Um, I think that story will sometime be told um, in full. I wasn't able to get all of it, but I think it's, it's, it's complicated. You know, there, there really has only been one capture uh, since Obama has been president, as far as I know, uh, away from the conventional battlefields, uh, Iraq, Af Af Afghanistan, um, you know, in places like Yemen and, and Somalia, which really presents the, present the biggest challenges. And that was, um, interestingly, at, at the same time that the bin Laden operation was being planned, uh, there was a, uh, a fairly senior member of the Shabaab who was a liaison between the Shabaab and AQAP and was traveling back and forth uh, between Somalia and Yemen, and had meetings with uh, Anwar al awlaki um, and um, there was a uh, opportunity uh, to capture him on the water. Um, he was traveling back to Yemen, uh, back to Somalia, and uh, t C SEAL Team Six seized him in the middle of the night um, and uh, took him off to a ship in the uh, in the Indian Ocean and kept him there for I think 70 days trying to figure out what to do with him. Do we, uh, you know, do we uh, uh, try to find some third party country to take him to? Do we uh, try him in a military commission? Do we try him in a civilian court? Um, you know, do we hold him indefinitely? Do we send him to Guantanamo? And they had um, more than a dozen principals meetings, you know, national security meetings with the principals. Um, uh, fig trying to figure out what to do with this one, uh, this one individual. Um, and it's, it, they had more meetings over this guy, his name was Warsami, than they had uh, planning the bin Laden operation. Um, and it was all happening at the same well, time. What did they decide? In the end, they decided uh, to, uh, in, uh, the Justice Department at first didn't know whether they would be able to make a criminal case against him, but ultimately, they, they, uh, they, they, they did, they indicted him, and on the 4th of July, uh, they brought him uh, to uh, Manhattan, um, and uh, they were going to put him on trial in, uh, in the Southern District of, of New York. And uh, I have a little anecdote in my book um, where it's the 4th of July White House party, and uh, <laughs> uh, Eric Holder is at the White House, they're having their you know, barbecue on the White House lawn, and, He's munching on a hamburger, and Obama walks up to him, and um, and uh, you know Obama says, you know, we got him, brought him, brought him to New York, and and or I guess Holder said that to Obama, and uh, Obama said, looks at him, and he goes, he says, textbook, textbook, and what he meant by that was it was a it was a textbook um, kind of uh, balancing of 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 all of the interests the law enforcement interests the intelligence interests because during those 70 days they were able to to interrogate him uh and uh uh you know and and he he considered that to be um you know as uh, you know a, a textbook example of of uh, of his his approach to the war on terror the only problem is it's only happened once 
you know. And, and it could happen because he was taken to a ship that was sailing into international waters. Is and, it, and it also happened because, that, yes, and it also happened because they could capture him on the, high, on the sea, which was much easier uh, than um, to do an operation, you know, in Somalia uh, or in, in Yemen. Um, so uh, that in some ways made it unique. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. I don't remember what it was. The, uh, the sort of national security, counterterrorism, industrial complex. I don't, I don't know. It's not something that I uh, really uh, looked into. It's an interesting question, but I, I don't know the answer. Sorry. Great. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for a thank great you. presentation. Thank you.